Scott graduated from Florida State University, entered the Naval Aviation Officer Candidate School in 1972. He had a distinguished career as a Naval Officer and Aviator, initially as a fighter pilot, and then as a research and development project test pilot. He accumulated over 5,000 hours flying in over 20 different aircraft and with over 200 shipboard landings. During this busy career, he found time to earn a Master of Science degree in Aeronautical Engineering from the U.S. Postgraduate uh, School. Captain Scott was selected to be a NASA astronaut in 1992. He served as a mission specialist on two shuttle flights, STS-72 Endeavour in 1996 and STS-87 Columbia in 1997. Overall, he logged about a month in space, including 20 hours of extra vehicle spacewalk. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Dr. Shine, for that wonderful introduction. And thanks to all of you for that welcome. And thank you for inviting me out here this afternoon. It is a pleasure to be here. We were talking about the, uh, the weather here recently uh, and how beautiful it is today. And it's certainly in contrast to what we saw over the last few weeks. So it is a, a pleasure to be here. I, uh, I'm going to talk just a little bit about a couple of things. But first of all, let me... Uh, when I say it's, it's a pleasure, I really mean it. I was in Houston just a few days ago telling them how much of a pleasure it was, and I had to caveat that because the weather in Houston was cold and damp. <laughs> and the traffic in Houston was crazy. You know, people ask me quite often, do I feel safe or, 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 or like this, the space shuttle was dangerous? I tell you what, I felt safe on the space shuttle than I'd be driving on I 95. <laughs> I 95 in the case of Houston. Yeah. <laughs> Talking about things people ask you about, they, people will often ask me, did you see any aliens? <laughs> I kid you not, people actually ask that question. And I always respond by, no, the most weird people I see are right down here on Earth. <laughs> and most of those are out of 1995, right? Yeah. I'm gonna spend just a few minutes with you this afternoon. I'm gonna talk about a number of things. And, uh, and then we'll get to the, uh, the point at hand. But again, it is a pleasure being here because the, uh, the clubs, and I, you will hear me say boys club quite a lot because when I grew up, it was the boys club. It's the boys and girls club, now I'm fully aware of that. But when I relate my experience, I'll talk about the, I'll say the boys club, and simply because my experience was about the boys club. But let me thank each and every one of you for coming out this afternoon because I know you're here as supporters of the clubs, and the clubs are so very, very important to us. But before we get to that, let me tell you some other things here. You know, I was, we were talking about uh, my space flight experience here at the table, and I was saying that it was 99 when I actually retired from active duty flying. I can't believe the time has gone by so fast. It's been 15 years, I guess, since I actually left active duty flying. <laughs> But uh, the memories are still very, very, very vivid. When you fly in space, there are things that just cannot be eradicated from, from your memory. And I can remember uh, lying on, the on my chair on the flight deck inside of Columbia uh, 15 years ago when we were getting ready to, or more than 15 for the first launch, we were getting ready to, to launch. It was 2.20 something in the morning, so obviously it was dark outside and it was cold. It was one of the coldest mornings of launch since we had the Challenger accident, which of course resulted from cold weather. We didn't know that, didn't pay much of attention, but the, the press would always bring it up and ask us how we felt about it. Well, it didn't worry us too much. We were ready to go. But I can remember lying there, of course, this is my first flight. I'm on the flight deck, lying in my chair, feet up in the air, looking at the front windscreen, along with the commander and the pilot. And you can hear the clock count down. You can also watch it count down. You can watch the systems come alive, the engines begin to roar. And all of a sudden, all this smoke and fire begins to billow up around the front windscreen. And the thing is shaking and vibrating. And just as I'm thinking to myself, aren't we supposed to be going someplace? <laughs> the clock hits zero and boom! When you see it on TV, it looks like it goes up in slow motion. It kind of rises up in slow motion. In reality, it jumps off the pad. I was lying there all the time, boom! It sort of kicks you in the backside as it jumps off the pad. And like I said, shaking and vibrating is not a smooth ride. <laughs> By the time you pass the top of the tower, you have exceeded 100 miles per hour. 
And I can remember thinking my, to, to myself, oh, I sure hope they don't ask me to read any of these gauges because they're just all over the place. You roll kind of over to heads down, upside down, and rock across the horizon, passing Mach 1 in roughly 45 seconds. And you can watch your gauges. This thing just goes faster and faster and faster and faster. There's nothing else in existence that continues to accelerate that way. You can watch the tapes a click by Mach 3, Mach 4, Mach 5, Mach 7, Mach 8. At two minutes after liftoff, you're at the end of first stage, the throttles, the, the computer will throttle the engines down a little bit. Then there's a big explosion. And if you weren't prepared for it, it'd probably give you a heart attack. But you know it's coming. It's the end of first stage, and the solid rocket boosters are jettisoned away from the vehicle. They're exploded away. This bright, bright flash, a big explosion. Then the computers will run the engines back up again, and they'll go back to full power. You push back in your seat, and you begin to continue to rocket across the horizon. And uh, we go from uh, sitting on the launch pad to 17,500 miles per hour, and they're about in only eight and one half minutes. And again, on that first flight, we launched in the darkness, and about halfway through the ascent, I can look out of the front window and see the day half of the Earth coming <coughs> as we begin to circle the Earth in orbit. Absolutely amazing sight. And once you're up there, you can see some of everything from space. You can actually see the continents as they roll by. I remember the first time looking out of the window and seeing the entire continent of Africa coming in front of me. And down here, I can say, oh, that must be South Africa. We have, well, that's Egypt, then the Middle East, and so on. And you pass the entire continent in just a few minutes. And then over here, there was Asia, all of Asia. Then over there, oh, that's Australia. Australia is going by. And you continue around the Earth every 90 minutes, you circle the globe. So you've got 45 minutes of daylight followed by 45 minutes of nighttime over and over and over again. We literally see the sun rise. And then 45 minutes later, it's setting. And you see the sun rise and set 16 times every 24 hour period of time. At nighttime, you can see a lot of interesting things on Earth also. I can remember approaching the west coast of the continent of the United States on a night pass, and I could see the coastline in, in city lights. And down here, I knew, well, that must be San Diego. There's a little cluster of lights. That must be Los Angeles. There's a little cluster of lights. Oh, that must be San Francisco. A little cluster of lights. Well, that must be Seattle. You can see the entire thing all at one time. And then you pass for just a few minutes so you can make out uh, there's Texas down there. And then you reach the East Coast so you can see Florida. Florida has a unique shape, right? A really unique shape. You look at the map, you can see the entire shape of Florida in city lights, including a little stick going down the Key West. Incredible what you can see. From down here, if you want to see weather, we have to look up. That's where the weather is. Guess where you look to see weather from in space? You have to look down to see weather. There's the earth way beneath, beneath you, and the weather is down there. And one thing I remember so, much, so well was looking down at the earth on a night pass, and all of a sudden, way down beneath me, this shooting star comes flying across the sky, and then instantly it was gone, burned up in the atmosphere. I can also remember seeing, way down beneath me, thunderclouds. Now thunderstorms can be 50, 60,000 feet high, but from up there, there are tiny little puffs of cloud, and in the darkness I can see lightning rippling through the tops of those clouds. Another thing that stays with me forever, <coughs> on a night pass, I remember looking out of the space shuttle over there, way over there was Mercury. Right up there someplace was Venus, and Earth, of course, was right beneath me. The moon was over there. And as we were moving, the alignment was changing. And for one instant, there was Mercury, Venus, and Earth all in a straight line, and then the moon over there. And an instant later, they were out of alignment again as we continued around the Earth at 17,500 miles per hour. So what you see from space is absolutely incredible. The things that we do in space are incredible also. We took all kinds of experiments in space. We grew crystals in space. We grew plants in space. In fact, the plants that we grew were very interesting. It was a plant called Brassica rapa. It's a mustard plant. And uh, we took it because it can germinate and grow very quickly. So we could grow the seeds, harvest it, and then the mission bring it home. 
at the same time, scientists were growing the exact same plant on Earth. And the idea, obviously, is to compare the two plants to determine if there's a difference in the plant that was growing in space and a plant that was growing on Earth. We took laboratory mice into space with us. We had the mother mouse, called a dam, the D-A-M, and we had the babies, called neonates. There were three different age groups of babies, and we wanted to determine how well the babies did, how well the mother did, would she take care of them, would she eat, would she nurse, would she see about the babies, and so on. At the same time, we were testing a new animal enclosure module, because obviously, you have to take care of animals differently in zero gravity than you do down here. On the ground, you just put the food in the bowl, put the water in the bowl, and they eat. Doesn't work in zero gravity. And other things that have to be accounted for. So we took laboratory animals into space with us. We took robots into space also. Now, you probably know the space shuttle had a mechanical arm, what we call it a robot arm. But that's not what I'm talking about. We took another robot into space. Now, it's not the kind of robot you see on TV. It doesn't have arms and legs and it walk like this. The robot we took looks just like a big soccer ball, just a big round ball. But its eyes were stereoscopic television cameras. It was programmable. We could send it where we wanted, or we could guide it ourselves. And everything that the robots saw was beamed back into the shuttle and back into mission control. And the idea is that if you wanted to inspect the outside of your vehicle or your station, you send the robot. And if you detect damage, you can see people send people out to repair it. One of the more interesting things that I got to do was test improvements to the spacesuit itself. Because when I was flying, we were preparing to build the International Space Station. Space Station is located in a location space that was colder than we were used to going to. So NASA modified the suit. They put the suit on the flight before mine. The guys went outside to test it. They got so cold, they had to terminate the test, come back inside. NASA modified the suit again, put it on my flight, and walk had to go outside and test it. <laughs> so during my, during my spacewalk, I anchored my feet inside of foot restraints on the side of the shuttle that let me have, let me have both hands free and anchored me down. They rotated me towards deep space during a cold pass to get me as cold as possible. And then I activated different devices on the suit and gave them a running commentary and anything up there. So that modified suit was used to subsequently build an international space station. Probably the most interesting thing that I got to do in space had to do with a Spartan satellite. This satellite was a solar observation satellite. A Spartan 206 is what it was called. It was a $10 million, uh, 2,950, I'd say 3,000 pound satellite. Our job was to take the satellite into orbit, use the space shuttle's robot arm to pick it up out of the payload bay, place it out into space, and then we leave it. We back away from it for 48 hours. During the 48 hours, it was going to make measurements of the sun's corona. Then we fly back up to it, grab it, put it back into the bay, and bring it home. Then scientists on the ground could download its data and learn more about the sun. Well, the satellite malfunctioned. And in the malfunction, its attitude control system did not initialize properly. So the result was a 3,000 pound, $10 million satellite very slowly <laughs> turning in space. 3,000 pounds is about the same weight and mass as a small car. And this thing was about the size of a little automobile. So it was turning in space. Well, we, would, we wanted to retrieve it, obviously. You can't leave a $10 million satellite up there. Every time we'd fly out to it and try and match the turn rate with the shuttle, once we got where we thought we were in position, all of a sudden it was turning differently. We chased that thing around in space for an hour or so, and finally Houston, map, mission control in Houston said, okay, knock it off. You guys are using too much fuel. Back away from it, let's analyze this situation, determine what's going on. Well, over the next several hours, they looked at it, and it, it was determined that the satellite was rotating with what we call complex motion. So it would turn in one direction a little bit, and then it would undergo a mutation in turning in a different direction. Then another mutation in turning another direction. So it was a big 3,000 pound wobbly satellite. Because it was wobbling, we couldn't catch it with the robot arm. But that thing cost $10 million. <laughs> we had to figure out how to bring it back home. In fact, we were worried about, about jobs. You know, <laughs> we 
said, you are all going to be fired. We called Mission Control and asked them to send up the name of that truck driving school you see on TV, because we figured we'd be looking for new jobs when we got back. Anyway, over the next several days, it was decided with a lot of discussion, a lot of practice in the, in the, in the swimming pool on the ground and all, that the way we get that satellite back is from our partner and I go outside and catch it. Go outside and catch it by hand. So, on the first spacewalk of that flight, my buddy and I put our spacesuits on, exited the airlock, we locked our feet again inside foot restraints that got attached our bodies to the space shuttle. Let us have both hands free. And then uh, our commander was going to fly us up to it to catch it. So, I'm on one side of the shuttle with my buddy, Takao Doi, Japanese astronaut, on his first flight, by the way. First flight in space, first spacewalk. And we're asking to catch satellite. <laughs> uh, our commander, Kevin Kriegel, was inside the cockpit there. I'm here, Takao, and Kevin is there. The satellite is way up there. And over a three and a half hour period of time, we very, very slowly approached that satellite. And I can remember that to this day as we approached it, we watched it, and it appeared to be bobbling and wobbling just a little bit. We weren't sure the motion would be dampened enough for us to catch it and stop that thing. And I can remember talking to Kevin and saying, okay, the satellite is about five feet past. And he would file the jets and gradually move us out. And I said, okay, hold there. Okay, now it's drifting full. Okay, move us back. Okay, hold. Now stop there. Now rotate our support. And he rotated the shuttle a little bit. Okay, let's watch it for a minute. So finally, it came time to actually catch this thing. And I gave the, the signal and the go, and Takao and I reached up and we grabbed that thing, and you could feel all that mass. It was weightless. It didn't weigh a thing, it was floating, but you could feel all that material. And we had to start our movements together, we had to end our movements together so that we didn't lose control over it. Long story short, we caught that satellite, rotated it forward in the bay, and locked it down. But there was another complication that I didn't tell you about. When we initially approached the satellite, we were upright to the earth. Just like you're sitting in this room, the ground is beneath you and you're sitting upright to the ground. But in order to catch it, I had to have Kevin rotate us. Well, when Kevin began to rotate the shuttle, I could see the horizon. I could corner my eye begin to tilt this way. Now what happens to you when the horizon tilts? You're falling. You feel as though you're falling. And you instinctively want to right yourself which I did, but I couldn't do that. I'm attached to the space shuttle. There's no way I'm going to write myself. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, this is very disoriented. I'm getting a case of some weird space vertigo. If any of you are pilots, you know what vertigo can do to you. They're very, very disoriented. You have a whole horizon is tilting upward. Then I remember thinking, I've got to do this because I'm directing this whole thing. I've got to keep myself together. And I remember thinking back in flight training in the Navy, when we were learning to fly instruments, fly without reference to the outside, the instructors taught us that you have to ignore your feelings, just tune out what your body is telling you, and pay attention to your instruments. And then I'm thinking to myself, I don't have the instruments up here. <laughs> what am I going to pay attention to? And less time it tells me to take to talk about all of this, I thought to myself, wait a minute, the satellite is stable. It's not going in place. I'll just focus on the satellite. And I had to mentally tune out my feelings as the Earth began to rotate up like this and focus on the satellite and so that we could catch it. And if you look at pictures of this, and there are pictures available, you'll see us in space and the Earth is vertical, just like this. And we got the satellite up there, and I'm on one side, the cows on the other side. We grabbed the satellite, as I said, and we brought that thing home. And it was repaired and flown on a subsequent mission. Now, a lot has been written and recorded about the space program, about people who fly in space and do all kinds of interesting things. But not a whole lot is written about the people on the ground, the people behind the scenes that really make the space program work. I suspect it's probably that same way to an extent with uh, the boys and girls clubs. Most of us kind of know what the clubs do. We know that they're very, very important. We know they play a big part in people's lives. But the folks behind the scene, like some of you folks here today, probably don't get a whole lot of recognition for what you do. And you're the people that really, really make this the boys and girls clubs go. So I wanted to say all of that to say all of this. My personal thanks and appreciation to you for what you do in supporting the boys and girls clubs. Because the boys club, and we got the boys club for me, 
played a tremendously important part in my life. I grew up in Miami, Florida, and uh, was one of really the first, I guess, uh, African American youth to start attending the Southwest Boys Club. You know, I grew, I went to segregated schools until 10th grade. Some of the youngsters in here don't know what, what that's all about, but we all understand that's just how it was in those days. And even though the club probably wasn't segregated officially, the community was segregated, so we didn't go. So I was one of the first black kids, my brother and I, to start going to Southwest Boys Club. And I always tell, tell this story. When we first arrived along with our buddies and started going to the club, it was interesting. We, we almost expected to be run off. Like, go away, kids. You don't belong here. It never happened. Everybody was welcoming. They welcomed us with open arms like they didn't. We were just like, you know, nobody said anything or saw, or saw anything or treated us any differently than anybody else. The Boys Club dues at that time, it was something like $2 a month. I mean, it wasn't very much, but that was a lot for us. $4 a month for two little boys going to the club. And I can remember not having the dues. And I remember going to the club and I'm thinking, well, this is probably going to be the day they tell us don't come back because you, pay, you can't pay your dues. It never happened. Not only did we did that never happen, but we were always welcome at the Boys Club. Now, one of the highlights of my life was playing in a state basketball tournament. We had a nice basketball team there that we brought up from Miami to play a tournament in Tampa. I was not a varsity basketball player at Coral Gables High School, but I played some really serious basketball at the boys club. I got to experience some things that a lot of people don't get to experience because they're not varsity players. Some other things that are very important to me that occurred at the Boys Club. One of the things that's important in space, I told you about that, that satellite and how, how, how I had to lead that entire effort. Well, I later became a Boys Club uh, junior staff member. I was actually put on the payroll, made minimum wage, it was like $1.25 back then, folks. And uh, I coached the little boys basketball. I also refereed. I ran the arts and crafts department. So my point is leadership training, the leadership experience that I got at the Boys Club certainly helped me in my later life as a naval officer and as an astronaut. Communications, obviously communications in space when you're catching a satellite is very, very important. The communications experience I received at the Boys Club was very important. When I was 15 or 16 years old, our Boys Club, Southwest Club, had an event like this. I remember it. It was on two separate occasions. And guess who they asked to come up to speak as a student member of the club? Yours truly. I didn't realize at the time, as a 15-year-old, a 16-year-old, to stand up in front of a group like this was a very, very, very valuable experience for me. So I could go on and on and on and on about the benefits of my upbringing at the club. But I think you get, you get the picture. So again, my personal appreciation, my hats off to all of you who are, to, who are supporters of the, the clubs, and I hope you continue to do just that. The, uh, it, it's really interesting when you're an astronaut, you get invited all kinds of places <laughs> to do all kinds of things, and people want you to sign things. They want you to sign autographs. I mean, I'm, I'm very privileged to do that. <laughs> but they always want you to put an inscription and quite often, they want you to say, reach for the stars. Everybody wants you to write, reach for the stars. So, you know, uh, to John, good luck, reach for the stars. To Mary, best wishes, reach for the stars. Uh, to Fred, uh, want some lemonade, reach for the stars. <laughs> reach for the stars. I laugh about that and joke about that, but with the support that you folks give to the Boys and Girls Club, you're going to help some young person reach for the stars. And that is very, very, very important. And again, my hat's off to you. I applaud you. And thank you so much for having me out this afternoon. I want to do one more thing. I want to keep my remarks quite brief because I want to have just a few minutes to do some q and I won't take a whole lot of them, but, but when people hear an astronaut, they quite often want to ask something about flying in space. So if you do speak now or forever, hold your peace. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, we were talking at lunch about what you do uh, during the periods when you uh, 
don't have uh, duties that you have to do. Oh, yes. And what yes. kind of uh, entertainment you have, or uh, do you uh, develop some games or some whatever? How do you get along? <laughs> we, were, we were talking about that, and, and it is important to get along, because six people on a space shuttle is like six people living in a Winnebago in a camper. <laughs> you can't get away from anybody. You can't get upset and go out for a walk. <laughs> no, that you're, you're stuck inside it. But no, everybody gets along pretty well. And uh, the, the most favorite thing in whatever spare time you have is just staring out the window. That's the most fun thing that you like to do. I will say this, however, when you get to be an astronaut, I like to say this when, when the young kids in the room, uh, mom tells you don't play with your food. When you get to be an astronaut, you can play with your food. <laughs> One of the games that we play in space, now you have to use your imagination. You have two contestants and a referee. The referee takes a big roll of duct tape, you know, just a big roll, circular roll of tape, and you spin it in midair. So you've got this big roll of tape, just spin it in midair. One contestant over here takes some M&M's candy. The other contestant is over that side, and you try and float that candy through the hole. <laughs> Then this contestant over here has the cap. <laughs> then this contestant takes him on his candy and tries to float it through the hole on the table. You can see that's a very, very intellectual scientific game. And the one that gets the most candy through the hole that gets it caught wins the game. So you get to you get to do all kinds of fun things in space in the, the few weeks that you have some spare time. I'll take a couple more before my time is up. Yes, take this young man back here. How long was the longest time you were in space? My longest flight was 16 days I spent. My first flight was nine days on the shuttle Endeavour, and then 16 days on the shuttle Columbia. Yeah. Good, good stuff. And I'll tell you what, 16 days may sound like a long time on a small vehicle, but you savor every moment that you were up there because it is just so unique. And you never know if you're going to get a chance to go back in. It's just an amazing experience. I'll take one more. Yes? What happened to the mice? Oh, people always want to know about the mice. Actually, the mice, uh, mice did real well. Now, they all did not survive. The mortality rate obviously depended upon the age of the mice. So the ones that were older fared better, so some we lost. Uh, the earliest, if I remember correctly, were like five days old. They were something eight days old, some 13 days or something to that effect. But what was interesting, is watching the dam, watching the mother. The uh, animal enclosure module had two chambers to it. The neonates were so small, their eyes weren't even open yet. They were just sort of floating around. One would float out of the chamber, out into the outside. She would climb up the screen, grab it, and put it back in. Then another one would come floating out. Then she'd grab out the screen, grab it, and put it back in. She would eat her food. Her food was in the form of a stick, a food bar. It was mounted on the side, she would chew on it and eat it. Her water was contained in a container that allowed it to, to sip water out and it would close up. So the mother's maternal instincts remained intact. The mice uh, uh, survival rate depended upon their age, as you, as you can tell. And there's probably a whole lot more to it that the biologists learn once we return them to the ground. But very interesting uh, observations that we conducted for those animals who were in space. Yeah. Okay, I've used up all of my time, but let me thank you again for inviting me out to be with you this afternoon. Let me thank you also again, most of all, for the support you folks give to the Boys and Girls Clubs. You never know what's going to happen or what's going to come out of that club. If somebody, in fact I've said this before, if, if uh, a person had entered the Southwest Boys Club and watched Winston Scott as a young boy, they would probably have thought, yeah, he'll do okay, he's a good student, he comes, he comes from a, a good home, his family values, education. he'll do fine, he'll go to college, he'll do all right. But nobody would have ever guessed that I had done the things that I had done. So when you support the club, you won't know who, you're, who might come out of there. You may get a, a person that discovers a new procedure for treating heart problems. You may be helping a person that's going to finally discover a cure for cancer. You may be helping a person that's going to design the next uh, uh, big architectural building downtown. You never know what those little kids are going to come up with or, or, or amount to when, when, you, when you help them. So 
as an example of that, I just, again, I can't say it enough how much I appreciate everybody's support of these young people and all the others in our Boys and Girls Clubs. I go on long enough. Thank you so much for having me out. You folks have a nice day.